going to start with a quote from Banke. And some of you will remember who Banke is. Um, he was a fairly eccentric teacher in that he didn't have a temple. He taught out in the countryside. He taught the ordinary people, the, the craftspeople and the farmers and so on. Whereas many of the other teachers had big temples where they cultivated the um, support of the affluent and educated. And his teaching was very, his teaching was remarkably similar. His, the key teaching that he had was about the unborn mind. And in all, all of his talks, Banke is addressing this unborn mind. This mind that we always have, that's always there. And so this is a little short thing that he said, chasing after words, pursuing phrases, when will you ever be done? You run yourself ragged, amassing knowledge, becoming widely informed. Self nature is empty and illuminating, illuminating. So let things take care of themselves. There is nothing else I have to pass on. Self nature is empty and illuminating. So let things take care of themselves. Now, unfortunately, most of us are not very good at that. As simple as that may sound, we come from a culture that places a heavy emphasis on approaching life through the intellect. On using thought and analysis and evaluation and so on and so forth as our way of approaching life. Now that's not true in all cultures. One of the things that I found striking when I was with my friends who were indigenous Americans out in the West, they didn't approach things with their heads at all. They approached things with their hearts. They approached it with their intuition. They approached it from direct experience. And in that sense, we're much closer to the spirit of Zen in some ways than we are coming out of our highly knowledgeable state. And it's a hard habit to break. It's probably the greatest challenge that many Zen students have. I see it repeatedly in Daisan. We have the tendency to want to figure out, to understand, to analyze, to comprehend. And so unlike Banke, we do not let things take care of themselves. And we tie ourselves in knots in that process. And we make our lives complicated and we make our Zen practice complicated. And the longer that I kind of stay at this, the, the more I think, no, Zen should not be complicated. Our practice should not be complicated. So I've selected several several koans tonight 
to just kind of touch on this as well. And I'm just deciding where to start here. These are not ones that, are, that should be unfamiliar to you because they're ones that I come back to often. This one is from the Mumun Khan. Ordinary mind is the way. Joshu earnestly asked Nansen, what is the way? Nansen answered, the ordinary mind is the way. Joshu asked, should I direct myself toward it or not? Nansen said, if you try to turn toward it, you go against it. Joshu said, if I do not turn toward it, how can I know that it is the way? Nansen answered, the way does not belong to knowing and not knowing. Knowing is delusion. Not knowing is a blank consciousness. When you have reached the true way beyond all doubt, you will find it as vast and boundless as the great empty firmament. How can it be talked about on a level of right or wrong? At these words, Joshu was suddenly enlightened. If you try to turn toward it, you go against it. The way does not belong to knowing and not knowing. And yet, we continually try to turn towards it. We try to find it. We try to explore it. We try to analyze it. And when we do, just as Nansen cautions us, we go away from it. We cannot approach the Dharma with our intellect. Intellect is very good for some things, but it is not good for the practice of Zen. And so another teacher who I refer to fairly often, Dizang. And this is Dizang planting the fields. Dizang asked Zwishan, where do you come from? Zwishan said, from the south. Dizang said, how is Buddhism in the south these days? Zwishan said, there's extensive discussion. Dizang said, how can that compare to me here planting the fields and making rice to eat? Zwishan said, what can you do about the world? Dizang said, what do you call the world? You know, so I often see this koan in terms of a sort of Zen activism, if you will. And, and, I, and I think that element is here. You know, Dizang is feeding his community. He's working in the dirt. And in so doing, he's supporting the community and he is changing the world. But moreover, in the context that I'm talking about tonight, he is not engaging in the discussions and the analysis. He's engaging in direct action. He's engaging in intimacy with the world. He is not inserting the intellect between him and the world. He's not trying to figure out how to plant, he's planting. He's growing food.
There's another very simple koan that the Zong is in, which is simply a statement. The Zong said, not knowing is nearest. Not knowing is nearest. What does that mean? When we know, we're pushing the world away. We are isolating ourselves from reality. We're creating concepts. We're, we're, we're stultifying things. And when we don't know is not knowing is intimacy. Not knowing is being close. It's being close. There's no separation. The separation is something that we create up here. Back to Banke's unborn mind. We all have that unborn mind. Dogen said it. We are already enlightened. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to seek anything. We don't have to attain anything. We are already enlightened. But we cloud that. <laughs> We cloud that with our intellect, with our, again, once again, our attempts to analyze, our attempts to know, our attempts to put everything in a box, give it a label. All of which inhibit our ability to experience directly and intimately, to experience what Dizang is talking about, not knowing. So it brings me back as often as I often come back to the to the tenets of the Zen peacemakers order. The first of those tenets is not knowing. Engaging life from the unknown, the unborn. Engaging life by being and not by pushing away and analyzing and creating thought structures. By being, by directly being. You know, one of the things I think that drives a lot of this analytical approach is the desire to experience enlightenment. And as was talked about in, in, the, in the koan with Nansen, it's precisely that thing which drives us further from it. Dogen tells us we are already enlightened. I'm sure that every one of you already experiences moments of great clarity times of great clarity, times of great intimacy. But they get lost in the tumult of our lives. They may come and go so quickly we don't even notice them. That's what Zen about, is about, is about those moments, those times, that intimacy. When we ex approach things directly and we experience things directly.
Dogen said, Zen is a teaching beyond words and meanings. It is a direct pointing to the human mind. It's right there all the time. So what do we have to do? Banke tells us we have to remain in the unborn. What is that? We, ha we have to let go. We have to let go of all our complexity, all our concepts, all our analysis. And just be present. The second part of the Zen peacemakers is bearing witness. We let go. We don't know. We open up and we bear witness to life directly, unobstructed. You know, this is why Zen teachers used to beat their students. No better way to cut off intellectualization than 20 wax with a stick. Unfortunately, that is no longer politically correct behavior. And, you're, and it's very hard to do on the internet, by the way. But that said, you know, it's like, what was the point of all that craziness, hitting, shouting? They just cut it out. You know, Bob Newhart, the, remember Bob Newhart, the, when he was the psychiatrist on the Newhart show? And, and his patient would come in and sit down and start to say, he'd say, cut it out. Just stop it. Just cut it out, you know. Right? That's that's what those teachers were trying to say. Just stop it. Cut it out. Get out of your heads. Don't analyze. You know, coming in, you know, you know, in the cons we say they come in with these questions. Oh, what is Buddha? Right? What is Buddha? Here they are, Buddha coming in, totally obscuring Buddha because they're asking what Buddha is. Black. So you can do this for yourselves. I, I'm not, yeah, you know, I'm not your partner. That's not, <laughs> but I'm not advocating for self flagellation. But when we talk about letting go, the basic thing that we do in Zazen when we sit, we let go. Let it go. Whatever it is, let it go. Allow the song of the bird to be the song of the bird. You know, we're so conditioned that we want to know what kind of a bird is that? What's its Latin name? What's its range? Right, all of those things. All of those things obscure that beautiful, beautiful song. It's right there.
chasing after words, pursuing phrases. When will you ever be done? You run yourself ragged, amassing knowledge, becoming widely informed. Self nature is empty and illuminating. So let things take care of themselves. There's nothing else I have to pass on. For a treat, after all the shoe so craziness, I'm rereading The Snow Leopard. The what? The Snow Leopard by Matheson. Oh, Snow Leopard, yes, Peter's book. Which, you know, it's been 30 years since I first read it. But there's this chapter heading that's very pertinent. It's from Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlei. As the hand held before the eye conceals the greatest mountain, so the little earthly life hides from the glance the enormous lights and mysteries of which the world is full. And he who can draw it away from before his eyes, as one draws away a hand, beholds the great shining of the inner worlds. That was in Peter's book? Yeah. Huh. Yep, it's when they get to the monastery, the crystal, crystal mountain. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Oops. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. Peter, I, I have a, a, I have a question, and since I don't. Since I'm not near you, I'm not worried about being whacked. So we're sitting and I hear the bird and I am in love. But I find that, and I'm not, I, I'm not trying to categorize or analyze or compartmentalize or da-da-da-da-da-da. And the question I have is letting go. So the question I have is letting go of the heart attraction speaking to the magnificence of being here and the bird or just having heart open joy that we are gifted with the bird. I'm just... I, one is letting go, letting go, letting go, and the other, because I don't want to attach. And as you would say, don't make it complicated. So is it just in the moment, just we're human? We're gifted with hearing the bird. Yeah. It, it, we, it, where we err is that we immediately start to attach and we immediately come up against impermanence, right? So we, yes. we hear the lovely song of the, well, let's say today, beautiful, sunny summer yes. day, wonderful day. And then all of a sudden I'm thinking, oh, it's the end of July, August is coming. Summer's <laughs> gonna end soon. It's gonna be winter. It's gonna get dark. It's gonna get cold. I could go down that, you know, and all of a sudden I'm suffering. Instead of having the joy of a beautiful summer day, I'm like, oh crap, this is going away, you know? And we do that constantly in almost every context, right? So that's the danger that in loving the summer day, we can start to cling to the summer day, right? Yes. And so it's a matter of, and, and it's an art to be able to experience the moment and experience whatever is in that moment. And if what's in that moment is joy, then experience the joy, but not cling to the joy. In the next moment, it might be sadness. It might be fear. I don't know, you know. And so part of what Zen is saying is 
we be with whatever is there. We don't try to control it. We don't try to modify it. We don't try to cling to it. We don't try to push it away. Whatever is there. And so there are days we have joy and there's days we have sadness. Thank you. But I would go further to say when we have joy, be really joyful. You know, that, that's the other messages here is don't be half assed, whatever. If you're happy, be really happy. If you're sad, cry the tears. Live. Live. You know, our society is so lukewarm. You know, and we don't display emotions. And it's, you know, oh, you know. You know, I look at, you know, from my work, often encountering working with people around grief. And other parts of the world, when people grieve, they grieve, they wail, they cry, they beat their breasts, you know, and, and, and you know, if, um, if you did that here, they'd start giving you a Klonopin and Prozac, right? I mean, so, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, we would think that's a problem that has to be medicated away instead of part of the human condition that we all experience. And the way to get through our grief is to grieve, is to shed the tears, is to, you know, and, and, and that, and, and that not only is that okay, that's, that, that is healing, right? That's how we heal, you know? So in some ways, Zen is telling us, live, don't be lukewarm. You know, don't be, you know, just whatever it is, embrace it. You know, again, nonchalant, the great way is not difficult, only avoid picking and choosing, right? We're constantly picking and choosing. We like this, we don't like that. It's too hot, it's too cold, it's too, you know. It's a wonderful thing. If you live in Maine, right, we can complain about the weather every single day of the year. It's, it's a great opportunity. Probably not, Kathy knows New Hampshire is similar, right? And, and, and Colorado, you know. We've got something to complain about all the time, right? And so that's kind of, we're creating, that's creating our suffering. We create our suffering. The weather is what it is. It does what it does. But we start forming judgments. We start grasping one thing and pushing the other away. And suddenly we are in our own personal hell. And by the way, I do all of these things. It's part of my work, it's part of my practice to constantly be aware, constantly let go, right? These are habits, these are, for those of us who are ancient, they're ancient habits, you know? <laughs> so they've been around a while, you know? It takes, so we don't, we don't change them overnight. No, probably we will ever, you know, I keep coming back often to the Dalai Lama. You know, he started being trained at three years old, or whatever. It's some, you know, and 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 even he has human flaws. So the rest of us have to be patient with ourselves.
It's all we keep trying, we keep practicing, we keep doing the best that we can. And there's a dialectic that goes on between embracing our humanity and our human flaws and trying to improve upon them, both things, right? And it's again, it's one of these things that's seldom static. So we're often correcting, you know, but try, you know, and we're kind of trying to stay as close to the center as possible and not veer off too far into the direction of perfectionism and negating our humanity or being sloppy and uncaring, right? Every moment practicing, practicing. And it's a constantly shifting, shifting sands. So when you talk about um, sitting in the woods and listening to a tree, it's like we are wanting to listen. We want to be receptive, but we are not. It's kind of a beckoning, but it's an a not knowing beckoning. It's like trying to entice what we could so easily trample on by adding our own construct to it. But we are, we're, we want to be receptive. It's not that we don't want to touch and engage, but we want to do it in as open a way as we can. Yes. Well, we want openness is not knowing, right? Right. Openness is Buddha mind. Openness is what? Buddha mind. Buddha, Buddha mind. mind. Okay. So we want as best we can to be open, to be there, you know, and to allow whatever happens to happen. Right. And we're engaging with it. So we're, it's not that we are, it's not that we are, aspiring to undifferentiation. I don't mean to be intellectual. I'm just saying it's that we, so we are, um, We are so that's the, the that's a kind of choosing, but it's a choosing that is not knowing choosing. It's the choosing to be there. It's presence. It's yes. It's opening okay. space. We just open okay. the space. Okay. We want to be yeah. in the space, but we don't want to trample on the space by being there in a constructed way. And I, again, I don't mean that in a fancy way. I'm just saying. Nor, nor can we control or predict how that space is going to get filled. Right. You know, it's right. just there. It's just there. That, you know, that, that's kind of the back, circling back towards the whole notion of enlightenment and people looking for enlightenment. As soon as we're looking for enlightenment, we're closing the space. Right. You're constructing right. something and looking we're, for that. Yeah. And, and you know, we're, we're stifling the very thing that we're, we think we're looking for. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Once again, we have solved all the world's problems.
I don't even know what we're going to do next week. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure that I have solved the problem of my internet connection. So uh, I'll do the best to get through here. Okay. Creations are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to them. Reality <clears throat> is boundless. I vow to perceive it. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. Creations are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to them. Reality is boundless. I vow to perceive it. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. Creations are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. The is boundless. I vow to perceive it. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. You know, in that vein, I just had a an old memory. Do people know who Rishan is? No, Rishan, Mary Jo, you know Rishan. He was um, one of Dido Lurie's Dharma successors who ended up not going down. I'm down the scandal road that I'm not going to go down. But anyway, but what I was remembering was a moment many, many, many years ago, he was not a teacher, I was not a teacher. We were both students of Dido's and we were at the monastery and we had just finished the Shin. And it was a beautiful spring morning and we were working in the garden, you know, and it was just one of those perfect days. And he looked at me and he said something to the effect of, you know, it's a wonderful life, isn't it? And I, yeah, I agreed. It's a, you know, and in that moment, it was a wonderful life. Mm -hmm. And in the next moment, it was something else. You know, and it's, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Everyone have a good evening.